Hi everybody, welcome to today's video. For those of you that know me, welcome back. For those of you that are new to this channel, my name is Dr. Elise Tercy and I am a functional medicine doctor here in New York. And today's topic is something that I see far too often, far too often, far too often. Literally on, on nine out of 10 people's intake form, when they're coming into the office, there is chronic bloating listed as one of their top health concerns. And today I wanna to talk with you guys a little bit about bloating and um, give you guys a little bit of information about it that's gonna take away the food component because unfortunately, long-term sustainability when we're dealing with bloating is usually food focused and that's not the problem. So let's dive in. Before we actually dive into the things that are super significant for your health regarding other reasons outside of food that are affecting bloating, I do want to talk a little bit about food and clinical nutrition because it does affect you. Food is medicinal. It can make or break your cells. It can help you to repair tissue. It can help you to regenerate things, or it can make you feel really not great. So couple foods that I do want to talk about that are known to create bloating are dairy. Dairy, gluten, corn, and raw food. Those are like the top things. So dairy, it's very inflammatory. I'm talking mainly about cow dairy. I'm not talking about goat or sheep products. The compounds that are in the cow dairy are processed in our human body a little bit different than goat and sheep products. There are different subunits of what's called A1 or A2 beta casein, which just has to do with how the dairy is broken down in our body. Some dairy is definitely more inflammatory. So yes, I would start there if you're saying, I'm very bloated all the time, I'm not sure where to go with this. Step one would be to take a look at an inventory at your diet and see if there are things that are coming from dairy that are hurting your stomach because it's very inflammatory. Not all dairy is created equal, so I don't want you just cutting out giant food groups. That's not gonna be sustainable, but be mindful that dairy is something that we have to consider. More of the cow, cow dairy. Now, secret sources of dairy are gonna be in things that people are always like, wait, what? dairies in that of course chocolate but also pasta so a lot of times when i ask someone if they're having dairy they think they think automatically milk they say no i don't drink milk no i don't drink um milk products or i don't eat cheese well yes those are the main sources of where we get dairy the more notable ones we actually get dairy in so many things that we're not considering for example pasta sauce even the tomato-based sauces, there's usually creams or dairies in them. Pasta itself does have dairy. Some breads do have dairy in them as well. You'd really wanna make sure that you're starting to read ingredients and look at labels because dairy is hiding in everything. So definitely dairy, of course, gluten or notably gliadin, which is the protein that creates dysfunction. Now, gluten and gliadin actually open up the cells in the, the lining of some of our intestinal organs and they create that leaky gut concept. So literally gluten is, think about it as poking micro holes, micro perforations inside the gut. And now once food comes into our body, we're leaking things into our bloodstream. That's the concept around leaky gut is that micro perforations or small permeations in the digestive system are allowing undigested food particles into our gut and wreaking havoc. Food should not be found in our bloodstream. It should be found in our digestive system. So absolutely gliadin and gluten. Um, I know and I, and I hear this frequently from my patients is, oh, I'm doing whole wheat, whole wheat bread, whole wheat pasta, no wheat, no wheat, 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 wheat. Now there are wheat products that are gluten-free. They've actually pulled out the compounds um, and kept other compounds, but I would absolutely say Grains are definitely an inflammatory food for some people, not for everybody. You'd have to work with someone clinically to identify what works for you and what your goals are. But as a general umbrella statement, I do want to reiterate the gliadin and gluten is very toxic uh, to the tight junctions and to the, the different fibers in the digestive system. You don't want that being the case. You do not want to be leaking food into your bloodstream. That's going to create a whole immune system response. So gluten, gluten, gliadin, and also dairy. Of course, my whole concept is that if you're not eating meat that's either grass-fed or organic or organic grass-fed, 
you have to change that up because realistically, you, you could look at a regular egg for $1.99 or whatever they charge for them um, and then compare an actual good quality egg, organic egg, it is night and day. Not only do they cook differently with the temperature, their heat point is different, their smoke point is different, and the nutritional value of organic and non-organic food is totally different totally different. So texture wise, so many different things happen. You can actually see in the egg yolk of an organic egg that it's much more yellow. The color looks different. It's brighter, almost like yellow orange. And then the clear part of the egg white is much more clear. I, I might even insert a little um, clip here for you guys to take a look at the, the difference between the two. Not only did they look different when you're eating organic foods, and this goes for things like meats, this goes for things like fish, but the nutrients are, t are are entirely different. For example, if you took a piece of four ounces of salmon wild, four ounces of salmon farmed, they're, they're the same exact weight. Are they the same calories? Maybe, but do they have different nutrients in terms of vitamins and minerals? Do they have different essential oil profiles? Absolutely. So organic is a really, really important thing. Why we eat organic is because the things that aren't organic are sprayed with chemicals and pesticides and herbicides, and now they're in our body, they're in our gut, and they're also harboring in our liver, and that could lead into the next thing we're gonna talk about, which is organ dysfunction as the causative agent behind belly bloat, okay? So you don't want there to be foods that you're consuming that are just toxic to the stomach and really sprayed with things that should not be in our body that can create a lot of dysregulation and dysfunction even things like skin manifestations and rashes can be coming from the gut so i know that sometimes we look at our skin and we think oh well my skin is topical shouldn't i use a cream or shouldn't i put something on it no everything skin related is coming from your gut so phase one, phase two, phase three, liver conjugation, and really making sure that the integrity of the digestive system is in a good place. That's how we have good gut health, and that's how we ensure that we're not bloating. Now, if you've already done that, which a lot of you guys are probably coming to this video saying, I did that. I'm gluten-free, dairy-free, sugar-free. I don't understand. I'm still bloated, okay? Um, I want to talk about one other thing, too, that I just thought of that I want to share with you guys that can create belly bloat, and those are called polyols or sugar alcohols. So if you're eating things that are sugar-free, do not be fooled. Do not be fooled there is sugar in it. It's just not the sugars that are causing what's called an insulin response. So often my dieters or people that are looking to lo lose weight will say, well, I'm doing sugar-free. Sugar-free this, sugar-free that. Sugar-free is not the way to be. I know that sounds corny, but sugar-free is not the way to be because sugar alcohols directly impact the digestive bacteria. And when we play with the digestive bacteria and the colonies inside of our small intestine, we can create fermentation and bloating. What happens is that these sugar alcohols, while they're not mounting an insulin re response, meaning they're not spiking your blood sugar, they are affecting the gut. And the gut is so important to be balanced in terms of dysbiosis. We don't want a dysbiotic gut where we've got bad bacteria and then good bacteria in bad proportions. You will ferment food. You will start to produce hydrogen. You'll start to become methane dominant depending on the type of critters inside of you. And that's going to create a lot of belly bloat and a lot of distension. And I have women that come in that literally show me pictures or come to the office looking pregnant. They look three, four months pregnant. That's how bad this can be for people. And if we've ruled out the inflammatory foods, if we've ruled out gluten is out of the diet, gliadin is out of the diet, if we're making sure that we're not consuming sugar alcohols or fake sugars, anything ending in an I-T-O-L, for example, xylitol, mannitol, urethritol, sorbitol, those are all polyols or sugar alcohols and they wreak entire havoc on our gastrointestinal tract. If we've ruled out those inflammatory foods and we're still bloated, something else is going on. There's some other mechanism of action happening in the gut. And now we're gonna talk about what those might look like. Let's assume that we've removed inflammatory foods and we're still bloated. 
then what do we do? This is what we do. So we go to the organs. We go to the organs and we think about the integrity of the organ and the job of the organ. For example, let's start with the liver. When our liver is sluggish or inflamed would be another way to say that because of multiple things, like maybe we're consuming pharmaceuticals in high dosages. Maybe we're taking too much aspirin. Maybe we're taking too many medications. It can slow down our liver's ability to process and filter our food. We need our liver to process and filter food because if it doesn't do that, we will then get bloated. So part of digesting our food comes from having a healthy and really good uh, liver that's able to process foods. Now, if I were an organ, you guys would know, you guys already know this, I would be a liver, but the liver and the biliary system in general, it's emulsifying fat, meaning it's helping to digest or break down fatty waxy compounds like egg yolks, or uh, fatty compounds, for example, meats that might be higher in fat, grass-fed butters. You do need a healthy liver to process your food. And often my patients undergo liver cleanses. We do a liver detox with them to help further um, heal the digestive tract because if they're experiencing bloating and we've looked at inflammatory foods, we then have to go to the organs. Now, not only does a sluggish liver cause weight gain, cause headaches, cause chronic fatigue, it actually can then create what's called hypochlorhydria or it sets you up for a situation where you're not able to make enough hydrochloric acid in your stomach, which then leads to further bloating. Having things like acid reflux, having Barrett's esophagus, having gastritis, having irritation or ulcerations in your stomach is going to be another reason that you're bloated. Think of it like this, that if your stomach and the organs that live in the gut are not really healthy and there's holes and micro perforations and things inside of them, they cannot carry out their normal function. They cannot help you digest your food so that puts pressure on other organs to have to make up for the slack. So when your stomach is weakened because you don't have enough hydrochloric acid because your liver is sluggish, there's connection there between the organs. If you don't have part of your stomach, I know women that have come in and they're missing their stomach. They're missing a large portion of their stomach because they've maybe undergone gastric bypass or weight loss surgery. You are missing cells that you need in terms of processing. Often you're very deficient in B12. You're missing different types of intrinsic factors. And then here comes the chronic belly blow because you're not really processing fully. In the lining of the stomach, we have cells that are actually meant to help process food or start the digestive process, I should say. If you're missing your organs, that's another reason, okay? Um, any type of scar tissue. So if you have scar tissue, if you're a mom out there and you've had babies, maybe you've had a C-section, if there's scar tissue in the gut, it can be wrapped around or near to the large or small bowel and create belly bloat. It can also create a lot of pain when you're moving your bowels. So that's another thing that we wanna be mindful of is how is the integrity of my liver? Am I consuming way too many pharmaceuticals? I have women that come in and they're literally drinking polyethylene glycol. They're drinking antifreeze. You might be thinking, why on God's green earth would someone drink antifreeze? Because it's in Miralax. And if you can't poop, you take Miralax to go. Of course you're gonna poop because your body's saying, oh my gosh, get out. This is like so toxic. So of course it's gonna promote a bowel movement. But those types of things are hepatotoxic. They're literally toxic to the gut. And while they help with bowel movements, they end up creating more distress or more damage. It's kind of like those commercials where you hear the medications and they're like, well, this medication uses or it treats blah, blah, blah. And it sounds good at first. You're like, wow, that's really great. And then you hear the side effects and you're like, never mind. I think that I'll keep my eyes. I'll keep my limbs. And um, that's probably, probably a good thing that I don't want to die. So we have to be mindful that all medications, all pharmaceuticals are hepatotoxic at high dosages. And we need to make sure we don't have a sluggish liver. Uh, we also want to make sure that our stomach is producing enough cells that we need intrinsic factor that helps us absorb b12 the fact that we're able to process things and not have ulcers is huge and then also the integrity of the small intestine because the small intestine is home to this entire microbiome or this entire colony of living critters and if the colonies are not in a good place or they're misbalanced here comes the belly bloat 
So what can happen is we develop gut dysbiosis. Sometimes antibiotics can do this where if we're taking an antibiotic too frequently or even if we've took an antibiotic in our past when we were younger for an ear infection or for strep throat or for, for whatever they are using antibiotics in your life for, it does wipe out everything. Antibiotics kill everything, the good and the bad guys. But often what happens is if we don't re-inoculate or repopulate the gut with the good bacteria, we are actually introducing more bad species every time we eat. So by default, here I am having my salad and my spinach salad. Well, salads are harboring a lot of times E. coli, uh, the bacteria E. coli. Imagine that I've just gotten off of an antibiotic round. I've just been on a course of antibiotics. I've got no bacteria to protect me. I've got no bad ones anymore, great, but I also have no good ones. Now I'm gonna go out for my spinach salad with my friends and that salad does have germs and bacteria on it. Then what happens is now I've introduced bacteria into my gut that's exposed. It's almost like we don't have any potential um, protection, if you will. That's what happens is we don't have protection in our gut and that can create a lot of belly bloat as well. Okay, so those are a couple different reasons just to recap. Sluggish liver, stomach irritation, if there's inflammation in our stomach, ulcers, acid reflux, if we are having any scar tissue or have had surgeries, that's another reason we could experience bloat. If we, had, if we have gut dysbiosis, another reason we could experience a lot of belly bloat. So the point of the story is that it's not just about removing foods, it's actually more about rebuilding and repairing your digestive system, which includes the liver, the gallbladder, the spleen, the adrenal glands, the pancreas, all of the organs that live basically waist down. We have to make sure that they're in a good place prior to us being able to identify where the bloating is coming from. Okay, because that's really an important factor. So I hope that you guys found that helpful to learn uh, a concept that, wait, food isn't just the only reason why I might be experiencing bloating. Of course, if you have more questions, please link them down below. I'd be happy to answer them. I'm also going to be doing an Instagram Live probably this week talking a little bit more about this because, like I said, it's the most common thing I see in practice, more so in my female patients. Okay. Thanks guys for watching. Thanks for tuning in and be click be sure to click the video, give it a like, give it a thumbs up if you enjoyed this.